This is TTT Live. I'm DK Ronstar. The Ministry of Health is giving an update on the status of COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago. We're bringing you live coverage on TTT, Talk City 91.1 FM, and on Facebook at TTT Live Online. We go now to the Manager of Corporate Communications at the Ministry of Health, Candice Alcantara. morning, Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome to the Ministry of Health's virtual media conference. Let's try that again and make sure that you hear. Welcome, everyone, to the Ministry of Health's virtual media conference on the national COVID-19 response. We are here to give you up-to-date and accurate information on COVID-19. The members of today's panel are Dr. Avery Hines, Technical Director of the Epidemiology Division at the Ministry of Health, and Lyra Thompson-Hollingsworth, Coordinator of the National Alcohol and Drug Abuse Prevention Program, more widely known as NADAP. I am Candice Alcantara, Manager Corporate Communication at the Ministry of Health, and I will moderate this virtual conference. First to address you this morning is Dr. Hines, who will present the clinical and epidemiological update. Thank you, Ms. Alcantara. Good morning. Good morning to Ms. Hollingsworth. Good morning to the members of the media and the members of the viewing and listening public. Today's clinical update is the update for the day just finished, February 12th, as at 4 p.m. As at that date and time, Trinidad and Tobago had confirmed 7,637 positive COVID-19 cases. Of those, 7,323 have already recovered. There are 177 current active positive cases. Of those 177, 143 are currently in home isolation. And 29 patients are hospitalized, and those hospitalized patients are distributed as follows. There are 20 in the Kuva Medical Multi-Training Facility, and three of those are in ICU and there are nine at the Cora Hospital. We have confirmed five additional cases in that last 24-hour period, which relates to samples taken over the previous two days, and we have currently in quarantine 314 individuals. The epidemiologic update is brief and without slides this morning. What we would like to emphasize about the current epidemiology is that we are seeing a heartening trend towards smaller numbers over the past few days, and we would really like to encourage the population to continue the behaviors that will promote the reduction of spread. We're not seeing large numbers at this point in time, which means that the activities that we have been uh, advocating have been having the desired public health effect and that we need to continue those in order to maintain the reduced transmission that we are currently experiencing as we move into this very uh, different carnival weekend. We move into a weekend where we're not having Kiddies Carnival, Dimash Gra, Juve, Carnival Monday and Tuesday. We are aware that there are some substitute activities that may be planned. We would like to encourage all individuals not to breach the standing or the existing public health regulations and to be mindful of the health advice that we've continued to give on this platform from day one. We want to encourage any individuals with the symptoms of any respiratory illness, whether you think it's COVID-19 or not, not to go out into gatherings. You have sniffles, please stay at home. You have a loss of smell, please stay at home. You have sore throat, cough, fever, any of those things, unless you are feeling unwell enough to go to the health center or to the hospital or to see a doctor, then remain at home in home isolation. If you feel unwell, then contact your health facilities and you, you will be guided as to the best and most appropriate action for your health status. We want to remind all individuals of the new normal, wearing a mask over your nose and, nose and mouth, both at the same time, uh, covering your chin not pulled down to, re uh, to reveal your nostrils, that doesn't help. Uh, we want to uh, ask people to remain 
in compliance with the physical distancing. We know that hanging out usually doesn't mean staying six feet apart, but that six feet distancing is what's helping to prevent the spread of droplets from other persons to you and you to other persons. We want to advise again the hand washing, that frequent hand washing that we've, bec we've become accustomed to, I think, at this point in time. That's also helping not only to reduce the risk of transmission of respiratory illness, but gastrointestinal illnesses as well. So reducing the risk of diarrhea and diarrheal disease. We're reducing the risk of transmission of lots of uh, pathogens that can be transmitted on dirty hands. We want to advise people, as usual, to cough into a disposable tissue and dispose of it, then wash your hands, or if that's not available, cough into the crook of your elbow. And we want to, of course, advise all individuals to keep surfaces, shared surfaces, in workplaces and at home clean and sanitized with the routine cleaning materials that you have at your disposal in your homes. If we continue to do these things, we are going to continue to enjoy the benefits of the lower numbers that we're currently experiencing, and we will hopefully weather this interim period before we start the vaccine rollout and start the next phase of our response to COVID-19. We'll continue to weather this interim period with lower numbers and we'll be able to move around with some level of freedom contrary to what's happening in other countries at this point in time. So with that, I'll turn you back over to Ms. Alcantara. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines, for those words of encouragement and that reminder. And it seems that the majority of the population is following the guidelines. And we are so thankful and we hope that this continues. Um, this would usually have been a bustling carnival season for us. This today would have been Kiddies Carnival and a lot of other events. But this year we have the opportunity to find creative ways to celebrate and to enjoy our culture. As we do that, we have with us the coordinator of NADAP. She has some words of caution for us and advice on ways that we can celebrate this season safely. Thank you, Ms. Alcantara. Dr. Hines, media practitioners, members of the viewing and listening public, good morning. The National Alcohol and Drug Abuse Prevention Program, NADAP, acknowledges that Carnival 2021 has been officially cancelled, especially as it relates to instances that would ordinarily constitute large gatherings of persons. It may also be acknowledged from a cursory observation of the cultural landscape that the people of Trinidad and Tobago have found creative ways in order to appropriately commemorate the national festivities. Excessive consumption of beverages containing alcohol has typically characterized the carnival season, and therefore it is suitable at this time to remind the public of a few key points, particularly as it relates to the challenges associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. This slide, please. As we continue to live through a global pandemic, Citizens of Trinidad and Tobago have been asked to minimize external interactions. Therefore, in what would have been a carnival season, which often coincides with Valentine's Day, there will be no fetes or parades or any such events. Additionally, there continues to be no in-house service of alcohol at bars and restaurants. NADAP made the assertion during the Christmas season, and it is still fitting to reiterate it in this context. Alcohol consumption at this time is greatly determined by household purchases. The public is asked to conduct this activity mindfully so as to avoid the occasion of heavy episodic drinking or binge drinking while at home or at small family gatherings, particularly if there are minors in the home. Next slide, please. Heavy episodic drinking or binge drinking is generally defined as consuming a significant number of standard drinks over a short period of time. A review of the literature exploring research studies as it relates to heavy consumption of alcohol consistently reveals that there is a high associated risk for alcohol intoxication which is associated with a number of well-characterized changes in various aspects of psychological function. 
A number of scholars, such as Edgar et al., 1998, Holloway, 1995, and others, assert that these include changes in subjective mood states and feelings of intoxication, as well as impairments in psychomotor performance and cognitive processes, such as memory, divided attention, and planning. Additionally, it further suggests that alcohol increases sexual risk-taking and it also is linked to aggressive behavior. Next slide, please. Heavy drinking also places the individual at risk for developing or exacerbating non-communicable diseases such as diabetes and hypertension, both of which are underlying health conditions with lead, which lead to complications for persons who contract the COVID-19 virus. Next slide, please. Alcohol use, especially heavy use, weakens the immune system and reduces its ability to cope with infectious diseases, including COVID-19. Heavy alcohol use is a risk factor for acute respiratory distress syndrome, one of the most severe complications of COVID-19. Next slide, please. Alcohol con consumption may intensify fear, anxiety, or depression, especially when people are in isolation and should not be used as a coping strategy to deal with stress. Healthier coping mechanisms may include recreational activities such as exercise, family time, or enjoying the broadcast of a sporting or musical event. Next slide, please. Never mix alcohol with medication, even herbal or over-the-counter remedies, as this could make them less effective or it might increase their potency to a level where they become toxic and dangerous. Next slide, please. You are once again reminded that if you are a non-drinker, there are no health reasons which should persuade you to begin. However, if you're an adult, who consumes alcohol, the following tips are offered. Avoid alcohol beverages when thirsty. Your thirst may cause you to consume the drink much faster than you should. Space out your drinks. It takes the body approximately two hours on average to metabolize one standard alcoholic drink. Stay hydrated. Having water or other healthy non-alcoholic beverage options between drinks helps to manage intoxication and also prevents hangovers. Have a meal. Having a drink on a full stomach also delays intoxication. Do not consume alcohol in the presence of minors. Avoid drinking different types of liquors or mixing alcohol consumption with the use of other drugs or with the consumption of other intoxicating foods, such as cannabis edibles. Next slide, please. Persons are well positioned to enjoy the virtual expressions of the various art forms while observing safety protocols if sobriety is maintained. You are also asked to continue to wear a mask over your nose and mouth when you go out in public. Keep your distance from others. Stay at home if you are ill, wash your hands often with soap and water, or use an alcohol-based sanitizer. Cough into a tissue or into the crook of your elbow. Avoid touching your face. Clean then and sanitize surfaces. Next slide, please. If you or a loved one may be experiencing alcohol dependence or problem drinking, you are urged to call it. 77 well that is 877 9355 or you may email us at nadapprograms at health.gov.tt for further information thank you for your attention i now hand you over to miss alcantara thank you Thank you very much, Ms. Thompson Hollingsworth. As we move into the question and answer segment of this media conference, we ask our media representatives to indicate your name and the media house that you represent before posing your question. And please, no more than two questions each. And if time allows, we will 
go back to you for any additional questions that you may have. And we begin this morning with questions from CNC3 of Guardian Media Limited. Hi, good morning. My name is Sandy Gray from um, CNC3. My question is for Ms. Laura from Currency. Um, I want to know have your, what is the number or what is the percentage increase of um, requests that you have had from persons who might be suffering from substance abuse as, a, as it relates to the COVID-19 protocols and the um, isolation, the social isolation that it has allowed. Um, and I, that, I, that was my one question because I was going to ask what, or can you expand on the resources that are available to persons who are experiencing substance abuse problems during these times? Thank you very much for your question. Persons who are in need of reaching out, there are several um, treatment facilities as well as other support agencies such as Alcoholics Anonymous and so on. But the reason why I would have indicated to call 877-WELL is because earlier on in the pandemic, the NADAP Secretariat conducted a training exercise for the persons who would be handling the hotline calls at those numbers so that um, those persons are well positioned to talk through um, an individual and redirect them accordingly. Um, at current, we do not have the necessary figures to answer your question specifically in terms of a percentage increase, um, but that is something we are currently engaged in, in terms of collecting that kind of data from all of our stakeholders. Thank you very much. And just a question, are we seeing anecdotal evidence of increase in um, demand for resources or increased abuse of drugs or alcohol? We are hearing um, from our stakeholders in the treatment, from the treatment facilities, that they have received increased um, calls for persons who, are, who have become closet drinkers in terms of dealing with um, the effects of the pandemic and the isolation. So those are some anecdotal reports that we may have in terms of collecting the empirical evidence that is a process we are currently engaged in. Thank you very much. And we go now to AZP News. Hi, good morning, Prime Hari, AZP News. My question is to Dr. Heinz. I just um, we wanted to follow up on the on latest with the vaccine distribution in Trinidad, you know, when would they arrive? And the second question basically is, are we still, um, the concerns that have been raised um, with AstraZeneca, that vaccine, um, is, has the ministry taken note of these concerns, you know, especially um, to the elderly? Thank you. Okay, thank you for your questions, Mr. Bihari. Uh, the vaccines are on schedule to arrive closer to the end of this month. The concerns, I'm not sure which concerns you are highlighting. The last time you asked the question, you spoke about the fact that there were countries in Europe that had expressed hesitancy to move forward with the vaccination of elderly individuals pending additional information being made available from studies that were ongoing at that time. Subsequent to this, the WHO has in fact said that the vaccine from the individual, from the various studies that have come forward, the vaccine can be safely used in persons 18 years and over, which includes individuals 65 years and over. So there isn't a concern either about the efficacy or the safety of the vaccine in any segment of the adult population 18 and over at this point in time but we do note that if there are individuals that have other coexisting conditions or risk factors that may put them in a position where they are their health is less robust that you would want to approach those individuals with the relevant care. So there's a certain amount of assessment that will be taking place before vaccination of any individual and more so before the vaccination of those that constitute the elderly population. So yes, the ministry has taken into account all of the science, all of the studies, all of the reviews and recommendations that have been made by the WHO on the vaccine at this point in time. And we are happy to report that we will be uh, in compliance with the recommendation that we can use the vaccine in the 18 and over population. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. And we go now to Newsday, please. Good morning, Narissa Fraser from the Newsday. So kind of trailing on Kaya's question, I know that yesterday the Prime Minister would have said Barbados gave uh, 2,000 AstraZeneca vaccines, which were actually given to them by India. What I want to know is if the vaccinations with these doses are going to be done sooner than those coming from the COVAX, or is it going to, um, I guess, stay there until then, until that process? And the second question, in the same way in which the ministry usually predicts spikes for, let's say, when Christmas passed and New Year's and even Diwali last year, given the vigils held recently, though done in good faith, um, is the ministry foreseeing a spike uh, in cases following these things that are still going on, actually? Okay, thank you for the two questions. With respect to the first, the uh, vaccines that have been received from that uh, donation from Barbados as part of their donation from India still are subject to that emergency use licensing that we have to receive from WHO before we can utilize them. So the rollout of that batch of vaccines is still pending receipt of that particular EUL emergency use licensing. And as soon as that happens, then we can uh, look at timing for actual distribution. Now, the second question with respect to the vigils, again, a very good question. We note the activity, the gathering that would have taken place over the past few days with respect to all of the demonstrations of support uh, and the highlighting of the need for better conduct nationally. But what we hope has taken place is that even in the midst of those that individuals have been to some extent still wearing the masks, still maintaining some measure of distancing, although it doesn't always appear that way in the photos that have been taken. We do want to encourage anybody that is continuing to participate in activities along these lines to follow those guidelines even more closely. The mask wearing especially, and especially when in closer contact with one another. The groups of 10 being the largest sort of gathering or concentration of individuals that is currently allowed and advised uh, under the existing public health regulations. Observing these things is going to reduce the possible risk of transmission even in those settings. We would hope that sanitizers are being utilized by individuals, either their own personal sanitizer, uh, whoever is organizing these activities, maybe uh, has the opportunity to purchase and distribute hand sanitizer to the individuals participating. We are hoping that we don't see an increase in transmission as a result of these gatherings. The only time will tell. We will be looking at the data to see whether they are in increasing numbers as opposed to decreasing numbers in the wake of the activities. But it's an, it's an important opportunity to emphasize that even as life goes on, even as we move on with the various activities in the population, that adherence to those public health guidelines is going to be our saving grace with respect to reducing the risk of transmission. So we want to encourage everyone to do their part. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. And we go now to Express, please. Good morning, Camille Hunt Express. Um, Dr. Hines, we have heard that the purchase order for vaccines was signed late and therefore delivery has been delayed. Is there any truth to that? And also, um, other Caribbean islands are getting vaccines for half of their populations. Are our numbers sufficient at this time? Okay, there has been no delay in any of the process leading up to the acquisition of the vaccines. So that part of the question, I believe, is answered. We have no delays on our end. With respect to the size or the level of coverage in other countries, uh, you may note that the other countries in the Caribbean have much smaller populations than Trinidad and Tobago. So the same number of vaccines that we get may constitute half the population of one of those smaller countries. Nonetheless, our strategy remains the same. 
with the first set of vaccines that we receive, we will be targeting the front line and the, the high risk individuals, those persons that are at increased risk either of being exposed or of having adverse outcomes. And as we get additional vaccine, then we will expand the coverage to wider segments of the population with the ultimate aim of accomplishing herd immunity. And just to remind uh, the population, the, when we say frontline, the first set of frontline will, of course, be the healthcare workers, those most exposed. And the rationale for that would be that when we have the individuals who are most exposed to sick people covered by the vaccine, the risk of them, A, getting ill, and B, then transmitting the illness to other people becomes reduced. So the strategy, even with smaller numbers of vaccines relative to the population, is still targeted in such a way that it achieves the highest level of protection. After the frontline workers, we're looking at the 60 and over, the essential workers in the protective services. All of these targets then help us to reduce the two things that we're concerned about. First, those who are most exposed, and then those who are most at risk of adverse outcomes. So even as we ramp up the coverage, the initial strategy is still more than sufficient to do what we need, need it to do with respect to the reduction of risk of transmission. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. And we go now to TTT. Hi, good morning. Sonolala, TTT News. Uh, Dr. Hines, uh, just for clarification, I'm not sure if I, I would have missed it. Uh, the rolling weekly average, uh, what are we seeing in terms of where, I know there have been uh, very few cases within the past few days. Where does that stand now as opposed to a couple of weeks ago? Thank you for the question. So interestingly, over the last two weeks, when you look at the rolling average, it has been around seven cases. Now, this is in spite of the fact you'd have seen larger numbers popping up over that two-week period. We also had very small numbers, a couple of zeros in there. And as you are aware, when you average, you add all of those together. And averages in particular are susceptible to highs and lows. So the ruling average at present is either six or seven. It has been that over the last couple of weeks. And this is why we said at the start that we're seeing this heartening trend towards smaller numbers on a daily basis. But we are encouraging people not to become complacent as a result of that and not to think that okay we're good now and we can change what we're doing we really need to emphasize the importance of the new normal in maintaining those low rolling averages thank you very much and we go now to tv6 please hi good morning Unasa cutting tv6 news uh, dr Hines, could you say whether all measures are in place for the anticipated arrival of the vaccines at the end of the month? And if not, what is there still to be done, please? Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. At this point in time, all measures are in place and any additional measures that need to be uh, finalized will be finalized prior to the receipt of the first set of vaccines. So we are on track, we are on schedule to begin the vaccine rollout in the stated time frame. And we're looking forward to the actual active participation of the target groups. We're looking forward to the, the robust uptake. We're hoping that when we do get these vaccines and we're ready to rule, that there are people ready and waiting to have the vaccine distributed to them. We know that we have a very good vaccine culture in the population from the historical vaccination programs that we have engaged in. And we're really hoping and expecting that this sensible culture will prevail and will spill over into the uptake for this new vaccine. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. And just to let the public know that we're actually continuing with simulation exercises. There, there's a lot of work happening behind the scenes. And as we're here on the conference now, our colleagues are um, conducting a vaccination, a COVID-19 um, vaccine simulation exercise. So we're not just sitting, talking the talk, but we are also walking the walk. And I don't um, seem to have any more questions from um, members of the media. Um, but what I did want to ask um, uh, the coordinator from NADAP, um, we see a lot of persons uh, having um, 
the virtual um they're watching the virtual carnival activities and inviting um, friends and family over and i can imagine at some of these gatherings alcohol may be involved what kind of advice do you have specifically for persons who have friends and family over although we do not encourage persons to have anyone outside of their bubble in the homes miss thompson you want to give us some additional advice in this regard please Thank you, Candice, for your question. Um, my advice would be to keep those numbers as small as possible, um, to keep the spacing between persons, as um, we've constantly reiterated, to keep the space between persons at least six feet, and what I would have indicated in my presentation, to continue to, ob to observe um, safe drinking practices, that you don't engage in binge drinking, if you're an adult in the space and you're having drinks, have space out your drinks and have them um, interspaced with a non-alcoholic beverages, especially water, because what increases the chance of having a hangover or being extremely intoxicated would be drinking too much without being hydrated enough. So maintaining hydration um, while entertaining friends and family would be one of the would be the major um, piece of advice that I would have for members of the public during this time. Thank you, Candice. Thank you very much. And just a reminder: just because someone's your friend or even your family member, it doesn't mean that they don't have COVID nineteen, and it doesn't mean that they cannot spread that to you and your bubble within your home. So please, everyone, just be careful. We're doing quite a good job. Thus far as the numbers show, Dr. Hines, um, please let us hold on. Um, I think in the last conference we had Dr. Othello who reminded us, you know, that we don't want to risk future fun for one moment right now. Um, and then you end up getting ill and having to be hospitalized. So please be careful, everyone. I think we have a follow-up question or two from TV6, please to find out if the ministry has a contingency plan in place in the event that sufficient persons don't come out to get vaccinated and also what the consequence of a, a scenario like that could mean for the country, please. But the essence of it. Now, part of the contingency planning is actually what we're doing up front. What we are doing at present is that we are engaging the various stakeholder groups. We are also providing a lot of information to the public on the relevance, on the importance, on the utility, the usefulness of the vaccinations. And we do expect that within the healthcare system, for example, those who are most exposed will be enthusiastic in their uptake. We are expecting that those who are at highest risk, and those include the persons over 60, those with the, as we keep saying, the pre-existing or the comorbid conditions, diabetes, hypertension, etc., that they will also want to capitalize on the ability to reduce their risk of becoming severely ill and becoming, uh, or having an, an adverse outcome. We will move down the priority listing if the first groupings, as, as we move from one grouping to another, if we have vaccine remaining, we will move down the priority listing to the next set. And the list is actually quite extensive and covers a large number of people. So we do feel fairly confident that with the vaccines that we are receiving and the people that we have targeted, that we should be able to utilize the vaccine in and across those priority listings in an inefficient way, in, in, in an efficient way. So I feel that the, uh, the concern, while warranted, is one that has been addressed by the strategy that we have outlined at this point in time. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. And it seems that we have been quite clear this morning and you've gotten the answers to all your questions. I'm not sure if we have any more questions. Um, is, am I seeing Express asking one more question? Yes, morning again. Um, I'm not sure if it was addressed earlier, but Dr. Hanks, has TNT requested any vaccines from India? 
Okay, so requested, no. We are currently uh, engaged in discussions with PAHO WHO and the COVAX facility. However, you may have missed where we spoke about vaccines that we would have received as a donation from Barbados. And that donation came from uh, stock that they would have received from India. So I'm not sure if that is the uh, question that you're asking. Um, and we've also had, as I'm being reminded, beyond the COVAX facility, we are also engaged in what we call bilateral discussions with individual vaccine providers uh, with the objective of expanding the quantum of vaccine that we do receive. CARICOM initiatives are also underway to receive vaccines uh, through other channels that are going to allow us to cover larger proportions of the Caribbean population as a whole. So between the discussions with CARICOM, the bilateral uh, discussions, and those that are going on with COVAX, we have covered a, a fairly wide range of the vaccine supply and supply players and we believe that that will allow us to get the uh, necessary number of vaccines also reminding us uh, reminding the population that this process has been in play not just recently but it's the proactive process that was begun since uh, the middle of last year since 2020 so it's an ongoing process and it is going according to schedule and according to plan at this point in time thank you dr hines and we go now to ttt please Hi, good morning again, Sonal Lala, TDT News. Um, uh, Dr. Heinz, I know you s with regards to the, the vaccines from Barbados, are those already in the country? And if not, any timeline as to when they will come? I know it's sometime you said before we, use, we get to utilize them, but have they arrived yet? We can confirm that the vaccines have been received. As we, uh, as we outlined before, though, the timeline will be dependent on receipt of what they call the emergency use licensing that has to come from WHO. So that timeline can't be given without the receipt of that particular uh, piece of documentation. Thank you, Dr. Hines. And I don't know if you want to remind everyone why that approval um, is so important, that emergency use authorization. Why is that so important for us before um, we deploy the vaccines? So that uh, emergency use authorization is part of the technical and legal process of giving the countries that are distributing vaccine the backing of the World Health Organization to utilize the vaccine under emergency conditions. It is a process that then gives the uh, the distributing country the assurance that the relative the relevant uh, checks and balances have been in place. It's documented that uh, in your distribution activity you have followed all of the protective and all of the precautionary uh, steps in ensuring that what you give to your country, to your population, is safe and approved by the global technical experts. So we do want to dot all the I's, cross all the T's, and ensure that we are on the right side of both uh, the technical and the legal, uh, the legal fence, so to speak, with respect to distribution of these vaccines. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. Did we see a last question from TV6? I think I see Ms. Cuttings um, has indicated that she has a question. We can go to TV6, please. Yes. I know that um, private practitioners will be getting some of the vaccines to distribute. That's why I was wondering what measures are being put in place so that to validate the vaccines that they have, so to speak, so that persons know, okay, if I go to this um, private practice that this is a legitimate vaccine okay thank you for the question now whether it's public or private what we need to emphasize at this point is that the health system and the va distribution of the vaccine through this health system that coordination is taking place at the national level at this point in time the vaccines that will be received and distributed uh, will be distributed both in the public and the private system and we will be engaging, we've already begun to engage and we'll continue to engage those branches of the private healthcare system that can facilitate that distribution. So every uh, 
point at which a vaccine will be distributed will be under the quote unquote the supervision following the same guidelines reading from the same playbook receiving the same uh, content uh, so that the population gets a standardized rollout and a safe rollout whether in the public or the private sector. So that's a collaborative effort that is currently going on between the public and private sector to ensure smooth and widespread distribution of the vaccines in a controlled, in a well-monitored, and in an efficient way. Thank you very much, everyone who participated today. We have come to the end of this morning's press conference. As we close, I wish to thank everyone for sharing this morning with us. And I know we can live off the memories of carnivals that have passed. Remember that together we are taking this step to move further into the control of COVID-19, where we take charge. So please don't allow a brief lapse moment to prevent us from celebrating for many, many years to come. Protect yourself and your loved ones. Be safe, wear your mask, and all our persons in high-risk groups get ready because we are go coming close towards vaccination. We end with a video from the World Health Organization that will address vaccine myths and focus you on the accurate science. Have a good one, everyone. There are a lot of rumors and myths around vaccines and COVID-19. In Science in 5 today, we'll try to explain the science and facts related to these rumors. Welcome to Science in 5. I'm Vismita Gupta-Smith, and this is WHO's Conversations in Science. Answering your questions today is Dr. Catherine O'Brien. Welcome, Kate. Thanks so much. Pleased to be with you today. Kate, one of the rumors that we hear a lot is about infertility and vaccines. What is the science behind that? The vaccines we give cannot um, uh, cause for infertility. Um, this is a rumor that has gone around about many different vaccines, and there is, um, there's no truth to the rumor. Um, there's no vaccine that causes infertility. Kate, another rumor is about the vaccine somehow changing the DNA. What is the science and facts about that? Yeah, we've heard this rumor a lot. Um, we have two vaccines now that are referred to as mRNA vaccines. Um, and uh, there's no way that mRNA can turn into DNA, and there's no way that mRNA can change the DNA of, the, of our human cells. What mRNA is, it's the instructions um, to the body to make a protein. Um, most vaccines are developed by actually giving a protein or giving uh, a small, tiny uh, component of the, in, of, the, um, of the germ that we're trying to vaccinate against. And this is a new approach, where instead of giving that tiny little part, instead, we just give the instructions to our own bodies to make that tiny little part, and then our natural immune system responds to it. Kate, another persistent rumor about vaccines is about their composition, the chemicals in them harming the person who gets the vaccine. Can you please explain the science and the evidence behind this rumor? This is a myth. Um, the vaccines that we have are, are safe vaccines. All the components that go into vaccines are um, heavily tested to be sure that everything that is in there at the dose that is in there is safe for, for humans. The vaccines do contain a number of different elements, um, and each of them is tested before they're ever given to a human. They're tested in animals, and they're tested for any kind of um, uh, problem in the animal. Um, and only then do they go into humans, where we test in clinical trials with tens of thousands of people receiving the vaccines eventually before they're authorized for use in the general public. And safety is the most important part of those clinical trials. Every single vaccine goes through a safety evaluation um, to be sure that it's safe before it's used in the general public. In addition to that, the manufacturing of the vaccines has a constant oversight of quality so that every single ingredient that goes into the vaccine is assured to be of the highest quality um, and safe for use in humans. 
Thank you, Kate. That was Dr. Catherine O'Brien. If you have more questions about the vaccines, about COVID-19, please put them on our timelines on various social media channels, and we'll do our best to get to them in the next few episodes. Until next time, then, stay safe, stay healthy, and stick with science.